Now to our featured speaker of the day, Randy Baker. Randy is a person that's just inherently interested in nature and uh, will share with us many of his experiences and insights from Costa Rica. Has 12, 12 years of education in the field of biology, obviously quite knowledgeable. And he has a sense of humor to go along with it. So Randy, I'll turn it over Someday. to you. <laughs> All right, we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is Randy Baker, and we are gonna learn about Costa Rica today. Uh, normally, when I do school programs, I say, now, I have rules, good behavior. I don't, <laughs> that means listening, paying attention, not talking in the program. I won't cover that today. I'm assuming we're safe. And you can use a restroom, too. I always guess, no restroom. You guys are old enough. You can last for an hour. Uh-huh. And they go, okay. <laughs> you guys, I'll let you escape whenever you want to. All right. We're going to talk about Costa Rica. First of all, Costa Rica translates into the rich coast. When some guy got lost coming across the ocean called Columbus, he bounced into the coast, and guess what? The locals were wearing gold. He was impressed. Well, lucky for the people living in Costa Rica, gold was not discovered before Columbus came to North America. Uh, they didn't discover gold in Costa Rica until about 100 years ago. They got one small patch in northwest Costa Rica, just enough for the local artisans to use, and that's about it. The gold the no locals were wearing when Columbus saw them came most likely from Nicaragua or perhaps Panama. In fact, gold is the number one export currently for Nicaragua. So that's most likely where the gold came from. The real gold for Costa Rica is this right here. It's the biodiversity. It's all the plants, it's all the animals, the beautiful scenery, and all the rain. Tropical rainforests, and some of it, dry savanna, and other parts of it is not all the same. People think it's all rainforest. Only a portion of it is rainforest. There are more tropical environments than a rainforest. Uh, but in Costa Rica, and Costa Rica, by the way, is about one-third the size of Michigan. So we're talking a relatively small country with half a million species of plants and animals that have been identified so far, and they keep identifying more species every year. If you're not familiar with where Costa Rica is, it is not an island. It's, whoops, hang on here, we'll get this thing right. Hopefully, it'll, oh, it's not gonna point on that screen, is it? Uh, it's right there in the middle, right where it's point. It's right there on that little peninsula. That's a very small country. And nice thing about Costa Rica, it's very diverse. You see mountain ranges going in all different directions. Animals that might be living in the central part of the country are not going to be found over here. The ones along the coast can't get over the mountains to the other side. Animals might be within 15 miles of each other and they never get to wave at each other. Literally, one species on one side of the mountain, one species 20, 30 miles away. We were there a couple of years ago and just we got back a week before the pandemic hit and everything was shut down or we could have stayed in Costa Rica a long time. We were one week ahead of that. And on one side of the mountain, they were drowning. We couldn't take the traditional boat rides we always took because the water was too high, it was too fast, it was too dangerous. Other side of the mountain, literally 20 miles away, record drought. Monkeys were dying of thirst, even little millipedes under the soil were dying, it was so dry. Literally 20 miles apart. Climate change is affecting Costa Rica. It used to be, for a while, the weather fronts come off the Caribbean, so that side of the country gets wet. Other side's dry. Different time of year, the weather fronts come from the Pacific. They're the wet coast. The other side's dry. They used to switch back and forth. Well, now some of the weather fronts are so strong, instead of staying for 60 days, sometimes they're now staying for 120 days. They're staying longer. They're more severe. The rains are heavier. Believe it or not, you can even get too much rain in a rainforest. And the droughts are drier. And that's a lousy combination. So we're feeling climate change here in Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica is, not, as I said, not a big country. At the narrowest point from the west coast Pacific Ocean, the Caribbean, 74 miles. First time I took a trip there, I said, wow, it's small, man. I can drive from one coast to the other in just a little over an hour. Three days later, <laughs> yeah, the roads, you can see what they look like. Yeah, and that's probably under exaggeration of all the bends and curves in those things. Uh, Paul's Volcano, by the way, is probably one of the... Uh, most visited national parks uh, in Costa Rica. It's within sight, basically, of the city of San Jose. So all the local people go up there dressed in their shorts. 
You get up in higher elevation, it's downright chilly up there. You see a lot of freezing Costa Ricans up there because they didn't know it was going to be colder as you go up in elevation. Uh, made up of different tropical zones, tropical dry forest, Caribbean lowlands, and so on. Very distinct habitats in some of them. Uh, San Jose is in the center, uh, right in the center of this thing. I don't know why this pointer won't point at a, at a screen like that. It points at everything else. It points over there. But it won't point at this. Cool thing about Costa Rica is this. You've got to understand something. Going up a mountain is like driving north. For about every 300 feet you climb in elevation, that's equivalent to going 67 miles north. So you go up to uh, 10,000 feet elevation, and they have two mountains, Irazu, uh, and the other one's Cap. I can never pronounce it. Anyway, it puts you clear up in a Canadian type of habitat. They have blueberries. Uh, it, it's amazing. And people in Costa Rica have frozen to death. Again, some of the local people don't understand that. They say, well, you know, I can walk up over those mountains there, and I come down the other side, that's where my relatives live, they get up on top, and they're not prepared for the cold weather. So you have everything from tropical sea levels to literally equal to being in Canada. Now, the cool thing is, Lower elevations have more species of plants and animals. Go up a little higher, fewer species. Higher, fewer species. Higher, even less. Same as going away from the equator. The further away from the equator you go, the fewer species there are. Think about our Michigan weather. I looked at it today. It's supposed to be up to 54 today for a high. Saturday is supposed to be a high of 27. 27 degrees difference. I looked at San Jose, Costa Rica's weather for the 10-day forecast. There was the hottest and coldest day, three degrees. There was the hottest and coldest night, three degrees. And in fact, I checked down by the coast, 83 degrees, 83 degrees, 83. Six out of ten days was 83 degrees. The other one, ooh, clear up to 84. It's consistent. So that is why it is so much easier for animals to adapt and plants to adapt. They're not going 47 one day, 27 the next. You got two or three degrees. And by the way, we talk about biodiversity, all these animals and plants there. That does not mean more plants and more animals. It means more kinds of plants and animals. One of this, one of those, three of those. You get a herd of caribou up north, you got half a million animals in one herd. I guarantee you're not going somewhere in Costa Rica and finding a herd of half a million animals. Uh, so guess what? Biodiversity does not mean simply numbers. It means more kinds. And they have lots of it there. Tend to have lots of water, beautiful rivers, beautiful clear streams. They do have trout in some streams at higher elevations, believe it or not. We wouldn't normally think of trout in a tropical environment, but they are there. Uh, good place to get a nice uh, misty, misty bath. Uh, now, first time I went to Costa Rica, I saw these. Some of you might recognize the flowers in here. They're impatience. I thought, wow, this is cool. I'm finding, out, finding impatience where they grow wild. Yeah, they're an invasive species. They're native to Africa. I've seen, the, I've seen the wild ones in Kenya. I did wild tours over to Kenya, and they're not nearly as pretty as our domesticated form. But you go along the roads in Costa Rica, you'll see impatience growing along there the way we see dandelions in our yard. And they're just as invasive as, as the dandelion is in your yard. Uh, I always try to find this tree. This is one of my favorite trees, not impressive to most people. It's called Cecropia. Uh, we have a Cecropia moth here in Michigan. Uh, but I like these, because knowing where the Cecropia trees are sometimes helps you find the birds and other animals. They make a fruit that hangs down, like those caterpillars, we, we call them caterpillars off our oak trees and that, little things that fall down. They're called malarian bodies, they're full of protein, and animals gobble them down like candy. So I try to keep track of where the Cecropia trees are when I go to Costa Rica. Something to keep in mind. Heliconia flowers, uh, full of sugar water, nectar. Well, I shouldn't say that. One of these flowers has nectar in it today. The other flower will have nectar tomorrow. Another flower the next day. But the butterflies and the hummingbirds don't know which one has it, so they've got to visit them all. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Therefore, we get pollination. Yeah. Don't give out candy to everybody. Yeah, make them come knocking the door for it. And that's why we have many kinds of heliconia. Butterflies and moths. 1,300 plus. We say plus because they keep discovering new species every day. Uh, and 8,000 species of moth. Uh, the moth caterpillar down here is called a saddleback. We actually have these in the southern United States. When in Costa Rica, do not pet the fuzzy caterpillars. You don't want to pet this one either in the United States. 
or Costa Rica. The spines will sting you, and they will, they will be painful for up to a week. Yeah, we get stung by a caterpillar, wash off cold water first, then use duct tape to help pull the spines out. Uh, there's some species of caterpillars down in Costa Rica that actually kill people, usually the local workers. Uh, sometimes they're in mass, kind of like our tent caterpillars. You know, you get 5,000 little caterpillars all together. Well, they'll follow each other like a giant train. Some of the uh, workers in the farm fields might be leaning against a tree, harvesting a crop, not realizing it's not tree bark. It's coated with caterpillars. And on occasion, people die from them. So in the tropics, you do not pet everything. Well, <laughs> I'm a slow learner sometimes, but I've been known to reach out and touch a few. Uh, we have lots of different butterflies. Some butterflies, like ours, migrate, except in their case, some of these butterflies migrate downhill from one elevation to the other, depending what season it is. One of my favorite butterflies, this little guy right here called a cracker. Uh, they call them a cracker because they make a, I can't even snap my fingers. It makes like snapping your fingers. Uh, and that's to communicate with other butterflies. This is my territory. You stay in yours. So some butterflies are very territorial. We have some called heliconia. They're toxic for most animals to eat. We've got what's called a blue morph over here, an owl butterfly. Uh, lots and lots of different kinds of butterflies. Down there, they'll put out grapefruit or oranges, uh, bananas out for them. Uh, the cattle also feed them, okay, on the bottom. Uh, you'd be surprised how many butterflies feed on manure, even here in Michigan. There's trace minerals in that stuff, and they're getting it off. Nothing goes to waste in nature, not even the stuff a cow leaves behind. They got a beautiful butterfly house. Uh, at La pa we usually go to La Paz Waterfall Gardens, where they literally raise the caterpillars, they take the chrysalises, release some of the butterflies, others they will sell to zoos here in North America. Uh, some of the ones up on Mackinac Island, they, I understand they have a butterfly house, came from Costa Rica. This is a pretty good sized butterfly house, but they've expanded it since I took this picture. They literally hatch out thousands upon thousands upon thousands of butterflies and moths every year. Nice variety of chrysalis. The one I love is a gold one. It's called a orange spotted tiger clear wing. You wonder why I have a hard time remembering all these names because they usually put four words in each and every one. Uh, beautiful. And you say, wow, those are going to stick out like a neon sign. How are they going to survive? Well, they're also like a mirror. In nature, they're hanging there. They're reflecting the green leaves and whatever else is around them. So you'd be surprised how that bright gold chrysalis can actually blend in with the environment. Now, of course, others are easier to see how they blend in with green leaves, with dead leaves, and so on. Some look like thorns. And the one down in the far corner over here is called a blue morph. You say, why is it called a blue morph? It's not blue. It does not look blue there. Uh, we're going to go through some of these fairly quick, but they're beautiful chrysalises. And there's the blue morph. Back side the wings, front side the wings. You want to have a challenge, take your camera to Costa Rica. Try to get a picture of this thing flying. Good luck. Most butterflies fly fairly straight. These guys are so big and fat and heavy, they fly, they fold their wings, they drop like a rock. Then up and down, up and down. Up. Good luck. I was taking pictures of these things with film. <laughs> I wasted a lot of money, let me tell you. I got empty space. Yeah, nice picture of a tree, again, uh, because they're very tough to get a picture of. But you can see the chrysalis they come out of. Other invertebrates, it means other creatures with backbones. Again, almost ha half a million of them. Uh, the golden scarab beetle, again, reflects the environment and blends in with it. Uh, blends in with the trees and whatever else around it. Some of the mantises. Uh, leaf has spot on it. They've even got spots on their wings. Blends them right in. Like the mantises we have here, which basically came from Asia, by the way, uh, these guys are predators. Nice claws for grabbing their prey. Nice spikes to hang on to them. Uh, mantises, by the way, are famous for eating their mate. They are so genetically prepared to become dinner for the female when they're mating that as soon as the female, if she's hungry, she'll yank the head off the male, and while she's crunching off, the male's body pivots around behind and mates with her. That's how, how set the genetics have become. Well, I say, oh, bummer for the male. Good news for the species, though. 
Now she's fat and healthy. She's just got a good protein meal. She's all fat and full, which means she produces bigger, healthier eggs, which means his genetics are more likely to survive in the population. Might seem like a waste. The man was just going to die of old age in another couple weeks anyway. <laughs> Might as well recycle them. So that's the way nature goes sometimes. Now, leafcutter ants. Uh, there's about 50. About 50 species of leafcutter ants, and each species feeds on different types of leaves. Uh, what they do, the adults like this actually suck some of the juice out of the leaves, but that's not the main function of the leaves. They'll carry these leaves and other plant material down under the ground, deposit them. They'll sometimes make a pile of stuff under the ground 100 feet wide, weighs tons. They're growing fungus. Very special fungus. One species of uh, leafcutter ant eats this kind of fungus, another species another fungus, and it's actually food for the larva. The adults get their food from the plants as they're cutting them, but the larva feed on the fungus, and it's the only thing they eat. Uh, by the way, you can see the size of this uh, dinner compared to the ant. Sometimes there are flies that land right on the neck of the ant and lay eggs. And little flies burrow in, and they literally eat them alive from the inside out. Being an ant is not always easy. But sometimes you'll see these ants with a little ant sitting on his neck. He's the guard. He's supposed to ward off that fly, keep him from depositing his eggs in it. It's too small. It's a smaller version of this, and it's so small, the fly won't lay its egg on it. Uh, by the way, they can carry up to 50 times their own body weight. I did the math today, earlier this morning. I had nothing better to do. And I figured if I multiplied my weight by 50 times, I could carry two and a half Chrysler Town and Country uh, vans, two and a half, at the same time. That's equivalent to what, it's, what it can carry. Amazing. Some ants like sugar water, nectar, honeydew. And some of these uh, leafhoppers produce a honeydew. And they tend them. The ants protect the leafhoppers from other animals, from birds and things like that. Sometimes they get them to move, and so they lay their eggs in a new spot. More fresh sugar water. Uh, they protect the, the leafhoppers, and leafhoppers produce sugar water for the ants. They're farming those leafhoppers. Then we always hear about the army ants. Now, army ants don't have a home under the ground like most ants. They're wandering all over the place. End up in one spot at night from a big ball. It's just well organized. The biggest, oldest workers are on the outside, younger workers are on the inside. In an attack, they send the soldiers to fight off the enemy. When I go to the track, and they're making a bridge here, by the way. There's a gap. One sticks out, another ant climbs on, another ant, another, until they cover the gap. It's amazing what they can go across by forming a living bridge. Go to Costa Rica. If you, if you can find army ants, it's fantastic. Because guess what? They eat everything in their path. Everything in their path tries to get out of their way. Birds take advantage of that. Many types of birds down in Costa Rica call ant birds. Because they're following the ants, taking advantage of the grasshoppers and everything else that's trying to escape with their lives. And then they catch the animals that are trying to escape. So if you can find a group of army ants, stick around a while. You're going to see some really cool birds. Termite mound. We call it a termitarium. They got their own air conditioning, believe it or not. They, can, they build ductwork so the airs flow nice and smooth through there to keep everybody cool. And there are some parrots that take advantage of that, by the way. Might as well have an air-conditioned apartment rather than sitting out in that hot, wet, sticky air. And the little millipedes. Uh, you know, trying to keep all those feet clean can be difficult, by the way. So they have help. They have little tiny mites on them that clean off the bacteria and the fungus that get on their feet. I was at a pet store up in Saginaw probably 20 years ago, and they had some millipedes from Africa, and they said, oh, yeah, they, they had all these little mites on them, and, and we cleaned them all off. I said, do you understand what those mites are? No. We, I said, they're supposed to be there. They were removing the mites that were keeping them clean. Like, duh. <laughs> Learn a little bit about the animal you're taking care of or selling to people, eh? But anyhow, millipedes eat dead plants, recycle them, turn them into soil. Uh, largest spider that is not, in the Americas that is not a tarantula is the golden orb weaver. Sometimes one of them, sometimes groups of them, but usually one or two. Uh, this is the female. That's the male. That's not a baby spider, that's the male. Female is about a thousand times the size of the male. There's an advantage to that. He's so small, he's not even worth having for dinner. 
Okay. But uh, you'll run into these webs, very strong webs, by the way. They'll stop you in your tracks. And then there's the no mouth crab, or what they call a jack o' lantern crab sometimes. You'll see them sometimes in the year of the rainy season migrating to the ocean to deposit their eggs, sometimes half a million eggs at a time. Out of that, a couple might survive. They'll live sometimes five miles from the ocean. So you can be out in the rainforest at night, five miles from the salt water, and you see crabs running around. Underground during the day, out at night. They call them no mouth crab because it looks like a mouth, but there's no opening. The real mouth is down below. God, I wish this pointer would work on that thing. I have no idea why not. Amphibians. Wet environment, good for amphibians. Not so good for salamanders, by the way. They tend to prefer cool temperatures. They got a few down there, but not a lot. Red-eyed tree frog. That's probably the most famous one. It's one most tourists never see, except on a poster. It lives up in the treetops. It's nocturnal. Most tourists, unfortunately, go to bed early. They're not out during the rainy nights trying to find who's coming down to lay eggs. So very few tourists actually get to see the red-eyed tree frog except in zoos or on a poster. You got to play in the rain like I do. Uh, beautiful frogs, by the way. I, of all the trips I've taken to Costa Rica, I've only seen a couple times. You don't see them very often. We got lucky one time. When they're hiding, they look like this. He's actually got his eyes shut. What looks like a brown eye is actually the eyelid. He's got all the pretty colors hidden. So they'll hide during the daytime on the bottom of the leaves. Very good climbers. They sometimes say they have suction cups on their feet. No frog in the world has suction cups on their feet. I don't care how many times they tell you they do. They don't. Suction cup will grab glass. Leaves are not as smooth as glass. Instead, they have hundreds of thousands of microscopic granules on their feet, like sandpaper. You can find that sandpaper like texture with a little mucus, and you can stick on glass or a leaf. But some people are lazy. They just say, oh, they got suction cups. No, they don't. As a biologist, I'm kind of fussy about those things. Tell the truth. Say a few extra words. Uh, the eggs, they do not lay in the water like our frogs do. They lay them under a leaf. And a female might lay several batches of them. The male and female come down. They, she lays the eggs. He fertilizes them. And then tadpoles develop in these eggs on the bottom side of the leaf. That's usually laid over a little puddle. Eventually, they drop off into the puddle and finish their development for a few weeks to a few months. If the leaf gets shaken, some predator comes. The tadpole will actually drop out early, try to escape the predator. But they drop them into the pond, and eventually you end up with a little tiny frog. And as they mature, they change from a brown, you can see a little tail on this frog yet, uh, they change from brown to green. Poison dart frogs, green and black poison dart frog. Toxic. Uh, when they have young, by the way, the male does a little singing little puddle on the ground. Sometimes we're talking a fraction of an inch deep. Female lays the eggs, he fertilizes them. She takes off. He guards the eggs. He soaks up a little water in his bladder, comes back, puts water on them. Goes out, gets more water, keeps them from drying. It might actually do that to several batches of eggs. So he maintains them. Little tadpoles hatch out, they climb on his back. He'll climb up into the tree and drop them off in a bromeliad or some other plant that has water trapped in it. And they will feed on the algae or microorganisms that are living in that water. That's how the green and black poison uh, dart frog does it. This is called the strawberry poison, poison dart frog. About 30 different color varieties. Some have bluish legs, you call them Levi's or, or blue jean frogs. Some have red legs, some have black. Depends on where they're at. And this frog is probably three quarters of an inch to maybe an inch long for a big one. Uh, it, reproduction's a little different. Again, they lay eggs in a pond, a little puddle, I should say. Uh, he takes care of them for a week and a half to two weeks. They hatch out and the female returns. We still don't know how the female knows when to return. She returns. She takes the tadpoles up into a little leaf, puts one tadpole in one plant, another tadpole in another plant, and then she comes back periodically for the next couple of months, depositing unfertilized eggs usually five or six at a time. That's the only food that the tadpole ever eats. So she's feeding her young by putting unfertilized eggs in there with them. Amazing parental care for a creature this tiny. And by the way, they're only toxic because they eat toxic ants. In captivity, they're not toxic. They're not poisonous because they're not being fed ants that have toxins in them. This, believe it or not, is one of my favorite frogs. Looks a lot like our little spring paper. I call it a dink frog. 
He called it a dink frog because it sounds like dink, like somebody hitting a plate with a fork. Dink. And I like it because it's a challenge. Anybody can see the poison dart frogs on the ground. These guys can be three feet from you. Good luck finding them because they're squeezed in between two leaves three feet from you and you can't see them. And to me, that's more, of a fun, more fun. It's a challenge. Reptiles, lots of them. I wish I saw more when I go there. Most trips in Costa Rica, I see zero snakes. I would love to see, it, see more because I like snakes. Uh, I have seen them in Costa Rica, but not real often. A lot of lizards down there. The malachite lizard on top, nice and green, big spiny lizard. The spines make them hard to swallow. Uh, this little guy on the bottom is a type of Central American race runner. I did my master's degree studying race runners, how they grow their tails back. And this little guy over here, most people in the rainforest don't even notice him. That little anole, little lizard. He's so tiny, he's like a piece of grass. And a lot of people are not alert enough to see it. I always advise people, stand still for a while. Let things come to you. Look for movement. Uh, one lizard a lot of people do see, we see this on the Pacific coast, uh, the brown basilisk on the west, I'm sorry, that's on the west coast, this on the east coast, the green basilisk. Uh, they're also known as Jesus Christ lizards. They're famous for running on water. Generally, the little ones run on water. They're faster than the old ones. I used to run faster. I never could run on water, however, not even with a water ski very well. But these guys are good at running on water when they're young. Uh, they're kind of an omnivore, eating both plants and animals. They'll eat smaller lizards, small birds, things like that. Pet stores sell them sometimes. It's a dead lizard in a cage. They're not going to make it typically. Very, very rare. They're very nervous. And so even if you give them the food, they're quite likely not to even eat it properly. Uh, they make a lousy pet. Uh, they were in the markets a few years ago. I haven't seen them recently, probably because too many people complained about that $70 lizard being dead in three weeks. They have a nice crest on there, the big males do anyway. The females do not have that big crest. Uh, they're a little less attractive. Why? Well, I guess unless you're a male basilisk, then it might be fine. There they are going in the water. Ah, green iguana. Not green. Different parts of the range, they're different colors. Uh, in parts of Costa Rica, they tend to be orange in color. Also known as chickens of the tree. And they do taste exactly like chicken. I'll take one any day. Lousy pet, good dinner. I was at CMU, I had a professor, I had two dead iguanas. This is very dead, I don't know what killed them, but they were two dead iguanas. And he said, hey, can you clean up the skeletons for me? Which means you've got to boil them. I said, well, I don't know, that's a lot of work. But if I get one of them, sure, I'll boil them down to make this, get the skeletons, get all the bones for you. So I got boiling them down. I said, wow, that looks kind of like chicken meat. Smells kind of like chicken meat. Add a little garlic, add a little onion. I had iguana soup. Uh, by the way, some parts of South and Central America, they were trying to encourage people to eat iguana. Save the rainforest. We all need protein. You want protein? Cut down the rainforest and grow a cow. But you've destroyed habitat for everybody. And you only grow about 30 pounds of cow on an acre of rainforest. The nutrients get wiped out very quick. On the other hand, don't cut down the rainforest. Eat iguanas, you can raise 300 pounds of iguana in the same one acre of land. You don't kill them all, the remainders come down, lay eggs, and guess what? You got the next generation. Much more ecologically sound to harvest some iguanas than it is to cut it down to raise chickens or to raise cows. All people need food. And they're trying to encourage them to use this one a little more often. This is called a stenosaur or, or black iguana, found primarily, we find it primarily on the Pacific coast. I was laying in my belly, crawling close to get this one. You know, it creep up on them. Don't want to scare them too much because lizards can move fast. And this, by the way, is the fastest lizard that anybody knows of. Clocked at almost 22 miles an hour. So I'm over by Tamarindo, crawling on my belly to get these pictures. Somebody came walking down the sidewalk, tossed him a, a cheese puff, gobbled right on down like candy. That guy walked within three feet of him. He didn't take off. He knew what tourists were. I mean, I'm used to wild lizards. Uh, sometimes you see what look like tank tracks coming out of the ocean. Those are sea turtle tracks. Uh, we found an egg that, uh, for whatever reason, was on the surface. Sometimes the turtles don't know where other turtles laid their eggs. They dig, and up come eggs that were laid previous to theirs. Uh, one day we did find a young leatherback turtle uh, during the daytime. They're supposed to be coming out at night, but that one didn't read. 
a little place where the yoke used to be attached. We have a little belly button. Well, guess what? They got one too, where the yoke uh, was basically attached. We assisted this animal down to the ocean, giving it a little help. They need all the help they can get. Their populations are way, way, way down. We're talking probably 80, 90 percent in many areas from what it used to be just 50 or 60 years ago. Average weight 500 to 1,000 pounds. On occasion, they've been known to reach 2,000 pounds. Uh, snakes, boa constrictor, caught one once in Costa Rica. This guy was eating a, he was in a boathouse, eating himself a grackle. This grackle didn't make it back to your yard. Uh, might have been, spent the summer at your place, spent the winter down in Costa Rica. This little guy over here sitting on the ground, called a hog-nosed pit viper. It was kind of a fun situation. We were walking down a little narrow path about as wide as a chair. And I stopped, and I had about five or six people behind me. I said, keep your eyes open. I mean, it just kind of looks snaky around here. Sometimes we have that fifth sense. The person behind me said, oh, like this one? The path was as wide as a chair. It was in the middle of the path. I couldn't have missed kicking him in the head by three inches. And it just sat there. They're typically 14 to 16 inches long. The next year went back, same trail. Found another one, right in the path. Different colors, so I know it was a different individual. They come in multiple colors. Got reading the books. Often found at trails at Selva Verde. We were at Selva Verde. Those snakes read the book. They were exactly there. Coral snakes, beautiful. Saw two of them within five minutes of each other. That's the only two I've ever seen in all the trips I've ever taken to Costa Rica. They tend to be nocturnal. So sometimes we drive down the roads at night listening for things, watching things, keeping our eyes on the road. Beautiful snakes, not aggressive. They're not going to bite you unless you grab them. And even then, sometimes they don't bite. A bird-eating snake. I am holding him just behind the head because he, he had no sense of humor. He did not appreciate being chased and caught. He's kind of huffing and puffing himself up, trying to look ferocious. And to be honest, when I caught him, I did not know what species it was. I had no clue. I just knew it was a big snake, and he didn't look venomous. I've done a lot of work with venomous snakes. He's, by the way, got his scale spread out. Look how wide I am. Leave me alone. And sometimes you can find snakes like this by listening to the birds. They don't like the snakes. They yell at them. So sometimes you listen to where all the birds are yelling, and you can find some of the reptiles. Uh, the American crocodile we find down in Costa Rica. Quite often people go to the Tarcoles Bridge and you can see them down, swimming down below and that's a good safe distance to be at. On a rare occasion, people have been known to die from the American crocodile down there. This one was on the Pacific coast. We just did an estuary tour. We went up the estuaries, looking through the mangroves, come back, and we were looking for crocodiles. Didn't see any. Came back from where the boat took off from. Here's this guy laying there. <laughs> yeah, we've been out for an hour and a half, didn't see any. My partner says, yeah, they're, they're playing jokes on tourists, you know. Yeah, they, we go on a tour, there's no crocodiles, here it is just laying there. I mean, part of his tail was missing, big chunk taken out of it. I don't think you can see it, but there's a fish line hanging right there out of his mouth. She said, well, hey, it's a stuffed one. I said, it's not stuffed. She said, yeah, it's stuffed. She moved a little closer. It moved. I didn't know she could move so fast, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, they just sit there. Uh, some of the mammals. This happens to be a gray fox. Gray foxes have actually come abundant in Michigan. Back in the 70s, uh, they're extremely rare in Michigan. We found one dead on the road, and at the time I was working for the museum up at CMU, and we took it up there. But nowadays, a gray fox is no big deal. Uh, but they have short fur. They're not well adapted for cold, cold climates. Uh, Howler monkeys, they're one of the most famous animals you'll see down there in Costa Rica. They're your morning alarm clock. They can be heard for more than five miles away. They have special hyoid bones in their throat that expands the voice. Now this one's thinking about what he's going to do. They sit up in the trees, they watch the tourists. Yeah. You do not get under a monkey tree. Now, I've had, I, I mean, I lead tours down there. Usually, I like the people that are on the tours. I've had some people who weren't so nice. They say, I say, stay back here. Hmm. Stay back here. About the 20th time, I stopped saying, stay back here. Well, guess why you want to stay back here? Because I would warn them not to go under a monkey tree. No, there are people who found out the hard ways you do. Oh, let me get close. Let me get a good picture of this monkey up here. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I hope you got a lot of lens wipes. Okay. Because it's not this always, it's sometimes liquid. Yeah, monkeys are not fun. Uh, these guys are spider monkeys. That was a howler. These are spider monkeys. About the same weight, by the way, about 15 to 20 pounds, but they look a lot, lot more spindly, look a lot lighter. The difference was the howler monkeys feed primarily on leaves. Uh, leaves are hard to digest. Uh, it takes days to digest the leaves they eat. This spider monkey, on the other hand, is actually eating the fruit off this tree. They prefer fruits to leaves, so they don't compete directly with each other for their primary diet. And then uh, we get the agouti. Uh, these guys are, or, I'm sorry, agouti, Cotamundi. Uh, the Cotamundis, by the way, if you see a single one, it's going to be a male. Female and young travel together. Uh, they're actually related to the raccoon, but he's down here grubbing for, for whatever he can find. This is what they're supposed to be doing. Whoops, I'm sorry. But they also learn that people mean food. Monte Verde National Park, again, a very popular park. Big bus came in with a whole bunch of students. And of course, you got the bus driver. He's not going to walk the trails with the students, so he's sitting on the bus. All the windows down, so we get a little bit of breeze. Next thing you know, Dakota Monday, I see him walking. He was digging a little while. I see him walking with a sandwich in his mouth. He disappears. Pretty soon he comes back with a bag of potato chips in his mouth. He was going on that bus, raiding the kids' lunches and bringing them out one at a time. I kind of informed the bus driver he might want to shut the doors. Uh, yeah, they're as big a problem as a raccoon, except they're diurnal. They come out during the daytime instead of at night. And I have heard from locals that if they're up in the trees, getting ready to sleep at night, and you scare them, you shoot a gun, for example, they'll all fall out of the tree. Now, you can imagine 15, 20 of these animals, 20 pounds apiece, falling. Thump, thump, thump. Get out of the way. Uh, this is... Uh, called an olingo. He's also related to the raccoon and he's looking down at dinner. You can see a wire coming off to the side and he's climbing down that wire. Now he's supposed to have a long tail. have no clue what happened to it. But he has a short tail. And he's coming down to the hummingbird feeders to steal the sugar water they put out for the hummingbirds. Neat little creatures. Unfortunately, they've stopped leaving the hummingbird feeders out at night. They used to do it all the time because we saw some good wildlife there at night. Uh, and then they get done, you go back up. Like a lot of tropical animals, they do not have large litters. Believe it or not, raising a family in the tropics is difficult. For example, we have very few mammals this size going to have one young at a time. They do. Most of our birds lay four, five, six eggs at a time. Theirs lays two or three. There's a reason. Because it's warm all year long, a little bit of food hatches today, a little bit of food tomorrow, a little the next day. Our summers, as we know here in Michigan, are very short. Everything all comes out at one time. It's like a population explosion. Therefore, there's more food on any given day in the summertime to feed your young. And that's, by the way, why the birds return here to Michigan to raise their young. Why don't they just stay in the rainforest if it's so, one rainforest if it's so wonderful? Well, like this Olingo, they have smaller groups of babies down there than they do here. Three-toed sloth. Uh, they're diurnal during the daytime. The two-toed sloths are out at night. These guys are so slow, they have algae growing in their fur. They have little microscopic organisms. Sometimes an individual can have up to 900 beetles living in his fur. And there's moths that live in their fur. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. They, they climb down the trees about once a week to go to the bathroom. And like a cat, they dig a hole and they bury it. And then they climb back up the tree. The moth that lives in their fur will deposit eggs in the manure they put under the ground. And that's the food for the caterpillars. That caterpillar only feeds on one thing in the entire world. The dung of, three to of the sloths. sack wing bats, sometimes they call them white line bats because of the markings on the back. We have one here that's got a young one with her. These are all females. Uh, but this one's got a young. When they go out to feed at night, she'll take that young and hide it someplace. And then pick it up just before it comes back to the tree for the daytime. All the local guides that go along the rivers in particular will tend to know where these guys are. Because they hang out on the same tree day after day after day. Or maybe underneath the eaves of the building you're staying in. But they're, they're called sack winged bats. Because off on the side is this male. I don't know if you can see him over here. Whoops, hang on. Where is he? Whoops, hang on. We'll go back a bit. You can see him off on the side over here. That's his harem. He'll fight with other bats, kind of chase the other males away. 
Uh, but they come here to this tree every day. They call him a sacked wing bat because he has sacks under his wings that produce perfume. Hey, here, darling, smell this. I have no idea what smell it is if you're a bat, but, but the females apparently like it. Uh, we also have uh, long-tongued bats. You can see his tongue laying out on here, coming into the bird feeders at night. Now, you think hummingbirds are fast, you got to watch these guys. Man, these guys are cruising. They're in, they're out, they're drinking that nectar, the same way the hummingbirds do. Now, when it comes to birds, Costa Rica, remember, one-third the size of Michigan, has 880 species found so far, and they keep discovering new ones. Things are moving in from South America as climates are changing. Uh, all of the United States and Canada combined only has a little over 900 and some. And yet they have almost as many as the entire U.S. and Canada in an area of the third the size of Michigan. 180 are migratory, which means it isn't part of the year there, part other places. They do not all fly to the U.S. Some actually migrate from South America back and forth, the other direction. 47 endemic, that means they're found nowhere else in the entire world except in Costa Rica. Some are only found on one mountain. They cannot survive the tropical environments in between to the next mountain. Over the millions of years they've evolved to be their independent species. Literally, sometimes they wave, wave to each other on from mountaintop to mountaintop, but they never get to shake hands because they're simply too far apart. Uh, this is called a northern jacana. They do get into the United States, down in southern Texas, Florida. Got a juvenile over here, which means this is definitely a male. The male takes care of the young. The female can have five or six bunch of babies at a time. The males are responsible for taking care of them. Sun bittern, this is always a treat. One of the rarest birds in the world. It is in a family by itself. There's no other species in the same family of birds. It's one and only. And you're going to see it go down to Costa Rica. We have these in Michigan called green herons. Uh, some of our, our green herons tend to stay in the summertime, migrate to the American South. These guys stay in Costa Rica all year long. And bear through the tiger heron, feeding its young, by the way. The young is trying to get it to regurgitate a fish. The throat's expanded. It's going to spit out a fish for it. Uh, roseate spoonbill. They get some of that color from the algae that they eat, the microscopic organisms, the water they eat. They simply squeeze their bill back and forth through the water, filtering out the mud and eating the organisms. Hummingbirds, 50 species. Good luck identifying them all. They fly fast. And I don't know if you can see it, but a lot of them look a lot alike. Okay, they're very similar, especially when you get to the females. So it's very difficult to identify all the hummingbirds. And again, they feed on the various types of heliconia. This is one of my favorite, called the, the green violet ear. These patch of feathers actually stick out perpendicular to the body sometimes. I mean, it's like a little arm sticking out. Like, look at this. Look how shaky show you I am. Kind of a cool little hummingbird. And it's called a green crown brilliant. Uh, sometimes they're brilliant, sometimes they're not. Sometimes patches of blue on them. There he is again. Purple-throated mountain gem. And I don't know if you can see down the corner, there's a white-throated mountain gem. This lives on one mountain, this lives on a neighboring mountain. Again, can wave at each other, but can never get to meet. They're simply too far apart, too warm in the valleys between. I love these guys. And there's the female purple-throated mountain gem. A blue purple crown fairy, never seen a purple on the crown ever. All the trips I've ever been, looks like green and white to me. But we have found them on their nests. Their nests are very, very tiny, up in amongst the trees. This hummingbird is about six inches long. Okay, it's amazing. Called, called a violet saber wing. It's a beautiful hummingbird. And again, the colors all depend on the lighting. And by the way, getting pictures of hummingbirds with a camera, good luck. It's not just they're moving so fast. It's when you're using a flash, it distorts the colors. These hummingbirds are actually much more brilliant than these photos are showing. Unfortunately, we, I'm not a professional photographer. You use a flash, you dilute the colors. Okay? So it's very, very difficult unless you've got a $10,000 camera to get all the right colors. Uh, it's, it's truly amazing. You've got to understand, there is no such thing as a blue feather anywhere in the world. There are no green feathers anywhere in the world. This Hummingbird is not purple, he is not blue, he is not green. There is no blue pigment. You take a blue jay feather, it's not blue. Bluebird feather, it is not blue. You want to have fun sometimes? Find a blue jay feather. Pick it up, hold it to the sky, it turns gray. 
It is all refraction. It's the structure of the cells. It's like little prisms. The cells of the feathers bend the light ray so we see the blue, purple, green part of the spectrum. The problem is, it all depends on how the light's hitting. In one minute they look black, bends a little bit, looks green. They're always changing the color depending on how the light is hitting them. This is a brown violet ear, a black bellied hummingbird, orange bellied trogons, we're not able to cover them all. Uh, resplendent Quetzal, a lot of people go down there just to see this bird. This bird's about three foot long. Looks nice unless he's in the shade. Then he looks just like a black bird. I've seen them back underneath the trees. You can't see the green. Or they're just looking like they're black. Social flycatchers. Oops, with some young. Uh, black cowled oriole. Again, I only see two heads. This is one of my favorite birds down in Costa Rica too. Look about the size of a crow. Called Montezuma or a pendula. They tend to hang upside down and impress the females. Like, look at me, I can hang upside down. They spread their wings out and they make the sound of a giant water bottle. You know the gurgling sound? That's the sound they make when they're hanging from the trees. Uh, cool birds. Some of those colorful birds down there are tanagers. 51 species of them. We got a couple of them here in Michigan. Silver throated tanager. This little guy on the left, Tennessee Warbler. We have them right here in Michigan. They'll be coming back here in May. Uh, Brown-throated brown sparrow. Summer tanager, we get these in Michigan, and the Tennessee Warblers. So two of these three birds are actually native to Michigan. They spend the winters down there and come back here to raise their young because we have more food to feed their young. That's why they return. Flame-colored tanager. Crimson-collared tanager. Beautiful birds. Uh, flame, I believe red-throated ant tanager. They, they're the ones that follow the ant birds around. Pronghorned barbet. Whoops. Golden-hooded tanager. Whoops. Kiss kitty. We missed one. We, I think we missed the national bird of Costa Rica. Where'd it go? Uh-oh. Maybe it disappeared. It maybe flew off. All right. <sighs> Never know. And then we have, oh, there we go. Here's the national bird of Costa Rica right here. Clay-colored robin. All those other birds, that's the national bird. We always look forward to the robins returning in the spring. Actually, the blackbirds are the first ones to come back. But we like our robins, don't we? Hopping around. Guess what? This robin starts to sing just prior to the rainy season. That's good news for the farmers. So when they start hearing the clay-colored robin singing, all right, good news. It's springtime, basically. We're going to get some water for our crops. Yellow-throated euphonia. Wow. Golden-browed chlorophonia. Male, female. Now watch the feathers on these heads, by the way, as I change these slides. Brown, yellow. Again, it's all refraction, bending of light rays. So sometimes trying to identify the color of a bird can be very difficult because it's not a pigment. It all depends on the lighting. And they're out there eating the fruits off the trees. Uh, so sometimes it's important to find these are wild avocados. You want, if you can find a wild avocado tree where it's fruiting, man, that's the place to be because a lot of these birds go to feed on that stuff. Beautiful little birds. Blue crowned motmot. They're actually related to the kingfishers. Like a kingfisher, they, they dug a tunnel into a riverbank, sometimes up to 15 feet in. Uh, and they'll raise their young inside that hole. This is one of my favorites, the turquoise browed mot mot. We find these on the Pacific coast. They got this racketed tail. When the bird first hatched out, it had feathers all the way down. They gradually just fall off. They used to think they pulled them off. They find out now they just wear off, they just fall off, except for the ones at the end. And the way to find these guys, they sit back in the shadows of the shades, swinging their tail back and forth like a pendulum when they're nervous. If they're seeing you, they're going to be nervous. So we look for movement sometimes. And you can see the two different species side by side. Wilson's warbler. Another Michigan bird. So I know this was down there in the wintertime. Emerald toucanet. It's going to be their smallest to toucan. And the collared arasori. Read it, it's spelled, it's spelled like aracari, but it's pronounced arasori. These are all primarily fruit eaters. These guys tend to feed close to the ground. Uh, the fiery build on the Pacific coast feeds higher up in the trees. And you can see some of the other. We have chestnut mandible. They're the biggest toucans in Costa Rica. They're up in a the canopy. A little lower down, the keelbill toucan. 
closer to the ground, the collared aerosauri. Back in the thickest leaves, the emerald toucan each has their own space. Now, they're kind of, the bill looks heavy, but it's actually very, very light. Uh, not very heavy at all. But it does make preening their feathers difficult. So they tend to preen each other, clean each other's feathers. It's called aloe preening. Uh, well, I read the books, by the way, and they said, gee, you know, they, all these birds are cavity nesters, believe it or not. They nest in hollow trees. They said they do not make their own nests. The book lied. We watched them excavate a nest one time. There are still new things being discovered down there. I don't believe everything you read. Now, you got reading carefully, by the way. The book said, oh, yeah, we've actually watched them nest twice. Like, wow, two observations, and, and you can say what they do and what they do not do, apparently. Well, we found out the first two observations had missed out on an important part of their life cycle. Oh, if you're over on the coast, we tend to get the white-throated magpie jay. It's like taking a blue jay and letting him live next to a nuclear plant. They get big and long. But like our blue jays, they can be very noisy, they're very smart, they're very intelligent. They learn where to get dinner. Aha, uh -huh. crackers. And at some restaurants, you want to guard your meals. These guys will fly right in underneath the roof and grab them off your plate. Yeah, we normally have one person stay at the table, the others can go to the buffet. We do that when we go to Kenya, by the way. There's some birds over there. Guard your plates or you might have to go back sooner than you expected. Yeah, they'll steal it. Kind of cool. And by the way, like a lot of tropical birds, raising young is so difficult. Last year's young will help the parents raise this year's young. Oftentimes, last, year's gen last generation helps the adults. That's very common in the tropics because raising them is very difficult. Uh, common black hawk, roadside hawk, guess where he was? Right alongside the road, sitting on a power line. They named it correctly for a change. Pearl kite, we saw this back around 2000 when they weren't even positive they were living in the country yet. They said we expect to see them. We've had reports but we're not sure yet. They haven't been documented. They do keep coming up with new birds all the time. This was a melodious blackbird, again, one they projected was going to be arriving in Costa Rica. It has since arrived in Costa Rica. We saw it there. Uh, and then the black guan is the opposite. They're disappearing as they're clearing the forests. And that's a shame because this guy's very, very important for dispersing seeds of many kinds of fruits. If they're not there to disperse the seeds, different species of plants are going to disappear. Uh, they're still using some of the traditional methods of traveling, uh, but we still have things changing. Down here, this area, this is farmland. This used to be a habitat. Even in Costa Rica, they're ecologically minded. They're still losing habitat. Uh, tourism does help because they understand by preserving the habitat, it does create an income. You got a choice. Cut the trees to make an income or maybe take people out to see this stuff and have an income. Uh, this is what they do. Quite often, we stay in places like this. Uh, this is one here called... Selva Verde, I like it because they have these covered sidewalks. So at night you can walk out there when it's raining, look for frogs, look for millipedes, look for the dink frogs. Uh, that's what's kind of nice about this. Other times we say at, uh, stay at Selva Verde, the uh, biological station down there, because I like being around scientists. Because you go there and say, oh yeah, you go down this trail here and there's this, oh, and the bats are roosting over there. And, and that to me is a whole lot of fun. So we go to different places. A swimming pool for us, also swimming pool for toads. <laughs> We were at Tamarindo on the city coast one time, and there was a, they had a band playing. Band would stop, the toads would sing. Band would start, toads would stop. They were taking turns. We always had music. Great big marine toads, by the way, big fat buggers like this. They're toxic. Uh, about 20 years ago, they helped to thin out the American population. There were some people that weren't too bright. They thought that kissing toads was the way to go. <laughs> Boy, you little buzz. Well, sometimes they got more than a little buzz. Sometimes they ended up dead. Uh, get a little of the skin secretions, you, you, you kind of get fuzzy headed, I guess. But they didn't understand that if you really scare that toad and he gives you too much of that, it'll affect your nerves to where you don't breathe. It didn't last very long, by the way. Kind of word caught on that kissing a toad was not the way to go. Uh, they are native to Costa Rica. I am not beyond picking them up. I'm just not going to kiss one. Okay. Picking them up is not enough to worry about. You might get wet hands like our American toads. Ah, uh, this is down on the Pacific coast. Again, some of the places we stay along the coast. I love the ocean. I love going up in Michigan. If there's water, I've got to visit it. 
Same in Costa Rica. Now, I prefer the Pacific Coast to the Caribbean Coast. And this is what we have. Uh, skywalks, canopy walks are wonderful. Believe it or not, under the trees, quite often, not a lot of vegetation, not enough sunlight. You want to see vegetation? Get up on these elevated bridges going through the canopy. Wonderful things to do, and there's many of them there in Costa Rica. Poa's Volcano, about 9,000 feet elevation. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Uh, Arnal Volcano, it's erupting on a fairly regular basis. Stuff will flow down the hill. And it's kind of fun to take a spotting scope, basically a telescope, and aim it at it and watch that stuff falling down the mountainside. Showed a guy at a restaurant one time. We were down in R&R. &R. Waiter come out, and we had our spotting scope set up there, and we're looking at it, and I signaled to the waiter, yeah, come on over, take a look through there. He'd lived there his entire life. Always saw the steam, heard the rumbling, heard the thunder. When he looked through that scope, it was like, wow, that's really what it looks like? He couldn't, he'd never seen the red rocks rolling down the mountainside. We went there a year later, or two years later. He said, oh, you, you're back. He said, you were here two years ago on July 4th, weren't you? I said, I said, yeah. He remembered, it was two years. He said, you were here, and he remembered it was July 4th. We said, it's like watching the fireworks back home. So he remembered when we showed up. Now, by the way, when we showed up, we did not bring out our scope the second time. It was too cloudy. So it wasn't like the scope informed him who we were. He had that good a memory. They now have their own scope <laughs> set up so tourists can see the mountains. Kind of cool. You can make a difference. Uh, oh, by the way, this group of bananas, it was fun. <laughs> We're going on a river tour looking for stuff, and we see this banana boat. You know, they're having problem with their engines. They just could not get that bugger to go. And we see them half an hour later, and a pile of bananas looked a little bigger. They smiled at us, by the way. And uh, the pile was a little bigger, and they smiled and waved at us. We did some more cruising up and down the river. Saw them a third time. The pile was even bigger. They're still having engine problems. The third time, they didn't wave at us. It was kind of like, like, don't take my picture. What they were doing, Chiquita owned the property just on top of the hill. They're pulling in the shore, climbing the hillside, borrowing a few bananas. <laughs> Go down the river in another spot, borrow a few more bananas. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, Chiquita Bananas uh, in, that, in that boat right there. I don't think they have the stickers on them yet. Uh, but anyhow, that was kind of a fun instance. Uh, I do love Costa Rica. It's a great place. Lots of good guides for going down there. And I always tell people they are just guides because they do discover new stuff all the time. Costa Rica is a great place. I would love to say it's as good as it used to be. It is not. 20 years of development has lost habitat. They've gone from a lot of manual labor to doing things the way we do them, using weed whackers and chemicals to kill things instead of hand cutting, which is more ecologically sound. It is still a wonderful place to go. But the best time to go was yesterday. The next best time is today. Don't wait five years, because it'll be less than it is now. It's a wonderful place, but again, things are changing. So when you talk to somebody that was there 20 years ago, Guess what? It has changed in 20 years. I've been going there for over 20 years, and I've seen lots and lots of changes. Go whenever you can, because it's not going to get better. You might as well see it now with the greatest diversity you're ever going to have. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. By the way, if anybody's interested in going on a tour, I lead tours. Uh, I got some cards up here. We go to Costa Rica. We go to Kenya. Uh, I sometimes custom design tours. You get two people want to go someplace. We'll go to Costa Rica with two people. Uh, Kenya usually takes about four people. So sometimes I'll put them together. A uh, number of people sometimes determines the cost. Uh, but we go. get very personal tours that way. It's kind of fun. And you don't have to twist my arm a whole lot to want to go someplace. I like poking around these places. So anyway, thank you for the wonderful behaviors. I hope you enjoyed it. Guys, have a good one. So you're, you're welcome. I feel you've given us a tour. Well, it's always fun. It's always fun. I'm always ready for the next one. Anybody have any questions about anything? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, any cats like jaguars or bigger mammals? Uh, down there? Uh, I've seen jaguarundi down there. One's going across the road one time. Never see the jaguars. Uh, I've heard them. Had the bejeebies scared out of me by one. We were over on the Caribbean side doing a night hike. 
me and Coley were scouting for a new place. We didn't have a group with us. We're just scouting where to take people. And we're walking along this trail at night, which makes you nervous anyway, because who knows, there might be a venomous snake here, one there, you know, an eyelash viper. And we're walking along the trail, and all of a sudden, there's Ooh, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Nobody had to tell me what it was. I kind of figured it out in my own little brain. We walked the rest of the trail, got back to the resort, and said, what do you think that was? I said, you know what that was? I said, it had to be a jaguar. Well, shit, if I'd known that, I'd have been scared. <laughs> but since you didn't act scared, I wasn't. I said, well, I knew what it was. Said, Lo and behold, we talked to the people at the resort. Now, there was a canal there. Normal jaguars traditionally stay on the other side of the canal. We talked to the people and said, oh, no, they've learned to come to this side of the canal. They swim across, and, they, and they're going after the sea turtles coming in to lay eggs. So they've started doing it. said, yeah, they, they'll come right through camp sometimes. So I knew that's what that was. Uh, and didn't take much to figure it out. But we did see a jagger run. You go across the road one time, just a quick glimpse. Nice view of the cat. Uh, but again, not enough to get a picture. Uh, I wish we saw more cats. Uh, we do see cats on all of our tours in Kenya. Uh, I was there in January. I think we saw a jaguar probably five times, I think it was. We normally see them two or three. Uh, cheetah always. We always see lions quite often with kills, things like that. Serval. So in Kenya, we see cats on a regular basis. If you had, didn't see a cat, that'd be the first time ever. You know, we're talking jaguar. I don't hear this wall. You're in the vehicle. They'll walk behind it. They'll walk ahead of it. They'll walk between vehicles. I've seen cheetah in Kenya learn to use vehicles to hide behind. They'll walk right behind them, squeeze between, and a zebra on the other side don't know they're there until it's too late. So they're not afraid of the tourists. They've adjusted to them and are taking advantage of it. But down in Costa Rica, it's the opposite. They're very, very secretive down there. It's not a wide open. And that's the other difference, too. Uh, in Costa Rica, now when I went, I go to schools. I do educational programs, too, if you know a teacher wants a program. Uh, but anyway, in schools, you see these posters, all these wild animals, uh, monkeys hanging out the trees, and this bird, and that bird. And, and sometimes they even show animals from different continents together. <laughs> And everybody goes down to the rainforest in Costa Rica expecting to see animals hanging like fruit out of the trees. That's not the way it is. When you go down to Costa Rica, you work to see the wildlife. It's not like Kenya where the lions are here, the zebras here, the giraffes there, and you can't miss them. You can miss the wildlife in Costa Rica. They're back in the shadows. They're still. They wait for you to go by. More like trying to walk in a northern Michigan forest. How many have ever seen a bobcat here in Michigan? They're here. Most people who live a lifetime in Michigan never see a bear. They're here. It's kind of the same in Costa Rica. And to be honest, if a person goes to Costa Rica and then goes to Kenya, it's wonderful. But if you go to Kenya and then come to Costa Rica, it, it, you kind of got spoiled. Because over there, they're everywhere. So, but, you know, it's worth going and doing the work to look at them. It really is. Uh, but anyway, any other questions? Yeah? I'm aware that they have some preserves in Costa Rica. I was there one day on the cruise. Yeah, they have lots of them. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go to one of those. I'm just wondering how much of that is there where they're hanging on? To the I forget what it is now. It's not as much as it used to be, believe it or not. Yeah, they, they set some reserves aside, found out that eh, the money of the lumber was worth more than the preserve. They still have lots of preserves. Uh, I forget what percentage is, but compared to other countries, they have a good percentage set aside as either government preserves or private preserves, and there's both. And sometimes it's hard to tell one from the other. Quite often there'll be national preserves in Costa Rica, and right off to the side there'll be a private preserve over here with the resort, another private reserve over here, and that's, you know. And to be frankly honest, uh, one thing we don't normally go to, we, on occasion we do, is the... Uh, the mature forests, you know, the, the, the uh, virgin forests. Believe it or not, there's very little in a virgin forest. Unless you're living up in the treetops. So unless you want to walk around like this, and look, and on my neck gets real sore real fast, and it's so dark up there, all you see is silhouettes. So sometimes you go to Costa Rica and they'll say, we'll charge you an extra fee to go to the virgin forest. Well, that's nice, and it's a nice walk. But you're not going to see much. Okay, to be honest, you can save your money. If you, if you just want to walk, it's great. You, say, you want to say, I went to a virgin forest, you know, a, pri a primary forest, great. 
But if you're really looking for wildlife, that is not the place to go. Uh, we used to have uh, primary forest up in northern Michigan, white pine forests. Not a lot of wildlife back then. Lumberjacks cut the white pine down, guess what? The deer herd increased up north, and so did a lot of wildlife. There are a few specialist species that like white pine. There's more species like oak and hickory and maple and aspen and all the other ones that came in after the pine were gone. That's kind of the same down in Costa Rica. The most productive habitat is not the primary forest. The most productive habitat is habitats that's recovering from being cut maybe 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 60 years ago, and that's where the wildlife is. And that's true here in Michigan too, by the way. You know, you do not, pri primary or virgin sounds wonderful, but it's not necessarily the most productive. To see it is nice, but it's not for the, not for the wildlife, because you won't see much. Any other questions? Yeah? There were some slides of bananas out to feed birds. What would happen if we put bananas? I've out? wondered the same thing. Especially you saw that, you saw that uh, uh, summer tanager, the big red bird coming into them. They're feeding on the bananas. And a lot of places, they also feed birds rice. That is a myth, by the way, that if you put rice out there, it's going to explode in the bird's stomach and they're all going to die. Well, if that were true, we have a lot of dead birds in the world. A lot of places, they put rice out for birds. They do in Kenya. Uh, they do sometimes in uh, Costa Rica. Sometimes down there, if you didn't eat it for your meal, the cook's got a whole bunch left over, they'll put it out on the bird feeders. Rice and bananas are probably the two most common things put out. Especially the bananas. Uh, so you're challenging us to... So it'd be kind of curious, yeah. I mean, people here put out uh, uh, grape jelly for the Orioles. You want to track Orioles, you put grape jelly out. Oranges. You know, oranges, yeah. So, I mean, that's not exactly a natural food either. Uh, they've learned to feed on it. So I'd be curious to find out what would happen. You know, would the local birds, once they found it, take advantage of it? I'd be kind of, kind of curious to find out. But I've always thought that when I go down there. You know, you can see the banana go, ah, try that in the backyard. Any other questions? Yes? Costa Rica is an independent country. Yeah. It has been for a long time. They don't even have a military. Okay. They haven't had a military for, I can't remember how long. It's been a long time since they had a military. Uh, yeah, it's a good country. It's between Panama and Nicaragua. Uh, independent country, uh, relatively safe country. I mean, it's like anywhere, you know. There's parts of Michigan I wouldn't go to. You know, <laughs> it's the kind of, it's same down there, but most of it is very good. Uh, tourism is their number one industry. Well, I should I say it was the number one industry. I don't know if it is anymore. Well, last time I looked, it was. But it's a major industry no matter what. So it's a relatively safe country. Okay. Uh, all, all in perspective, by the way. Any other questions? Yeah. When do tourists go to? Uh, well, it depends. There, there's no bad time to go. Some seasons have more rain than others. But I've had people say, well, I ought to go to the rainforest. But is it going to rain? <laughs> Literally. I said, I hope so. <laughs> but, you know, we always want sunshine when we're on vacation, rain when I'm gone. <laughs> I've been there winter and summer. I've been there pretty much all seasons. And uh, usually it's a rainy season in one part of the country and drier somewhere else. Again, which way the prevailing winds are coming from. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. When we were the, uh, not the last trip, trip before, we were on the Caribbean side, and they were getting record rainfalls for a rainforest. Mm. Need to say, that's a lot of rain. It was like two and a half times the normal amount, but that's due to climate change. The fronts coming in are stronger than they used to be, and when it dumps, it dumps, and it dumps, and the other fronts aren't strong enough to push it out. So it just sits there. So things are changing. And the other side of the mountain, like I say, Record drought, because that rain could not switch to the Pacific Ocean. So it, it's, you know, it's changed. There is no bad time. Uh, you know, there's just, depends on what a person wants to see. I mean, I've gone to see the sea turtles. Seeing the sea turtles is difficult because when they see the leatherbacks coming in down the beach, you, you sit here and wait, and they say, yeah, yeah, they got three turtles coming in. Let's go. It's a trek, let me tell you. It is not for the for the week of leg, because you're walking through sugar sand, and you might be walking a mile or two miles fast to get there. Uh, you know, so sometimes we do the turtle watch, sometimes we don't, because it's unpredictable, and it is literally, the guides walk it every day. You know, they don't think, gee, 
That person's 75 years old, and, and they don't walk six miles every day. They, they, they're gone, you know? So keep up with them or, or don't see the turtles. Anything else? I hope you enjoyed it. Again, there's some information up here if you want. Thank you much. You guys have a good one. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>